What is up, Ignite Church? Gosh, good morning. I'm so excited that I get to be here with you in your home right now throughout this whole coronavirus stuff, whether you're watching in your living room, in your pajamas, in bed, on your iPad, whatever it is, we're just pumped to have you here with us this morning. Uh, and if I have not had the pleasure of meeting you, my name is Rob Kaz, and I have the awesome privilege of being the Fuse College pastor here at Ignite. Now, if you don't know, uh, Ignite has this amazing college ministry called Fuse, where every single Tuesday throughout the school year, we're gathering around 300 college students um, together at Hendricks Hall, where we get to dive into his word and where we get to kind of explore what it means to be a college student and walking with him. And we worship and we just get to do all these awesome things. And it's such a cool and unique ministry. Now, it is not the norm. What we get to do here at Ignite and with Fuse is so far from normal. It's absolutely incredible. And in fact, it's what brought my wife and I up here. Now, we just moved up here back in January uh, where we had been living in West Palm Beach, Florida for about 10 years or so. I had been living there. And it was this time of going to college and leaving and then getting to run a college ministry together uh, for about five years. And it was so good and so sweet. But towards the end of this last year, we really just felt like the Lord was saying, hey, I have something for you. I have something new for you. And so we started praying and fasting about what that could be, what that would look like. And he brought into our lives the amazing things that are happening here at Ignite. And so in January, we had the privilege of moving up here and it has just been such an awesome time and so amazing to see all that God is doing, not only through Fuse, but through Ignite. This church, this house is so special and is doing so many amazing things, especially in this season where the coronavirus is happening and we're social distancing and life's a little weird. Um, we get to be the hands and feet in a totally different way. And it's been so encouraging for me to watch us love on so many new people and in such a new way. Now, a little back history of me is that I'm actually born and raised in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, lived there all the way up until I was 18. And so my family's still there. And then I moved down to South Florida for college and I got to go to a small private Christian school called Palm Beach Atlantic University. Um, it's only about 3,000 or so undergrads, so a lot smaller than ECU, um, but had this awesome time. Now, when I went there, I did not go with the intent of knowing Jesus. I was fairly far from him at that point. I knew who he was. And a lot of people are like, why the heck did you go to a small private Christian school? Only because of him. Honestly, the only reason I went there is because he had a hand in that. And so that by the end of my freshman year, I had a relationship with him. That there was this moment where a guy entered my life and had a hard conversation with me and called things out in my life and showed me how Jesus had changed his life and it forever changed mine. And it's a big reason why I'm so passionate about college ministry and about college students, because that is the time where the rubber hits the road and we kind of have to make decisions of what am I gonna believe for the rest of my life? What am I gonna do from here forward? And so my wife, Femi, and I were just so passionate about college students uh, because of all these things. Now, during my time at PBA, uh, I got to be an RA in one of their dorms. And an RA, if you don't know, it's a resident assistant. And so basically it's another student that gets to care for and love on other students. And yes, they have to enforce the rules and sometimes they're seen as the bad guy, but um, this got to be a ministry opportunity for a lot of us because it was a small private school. Um, and so we got to really love on students throughout this. And there's this one day that I was walking back from class and came into my dorm, swiped to get in the elevator. And as the elevator door is closing, this hand reaches out and stops it, like right at the last second. And in walks this tall, blonde kid who I had really never seen before. I knew his face a little bit because he lived on my hall, but I didn't know him. And he walks in and he had the worst haircut I've ever seen. Like to call it a haircut is hard to say. This was a chop job at max. I mean, someone took shears and just took chunks of hair out of it. He was missing 
patches of hair. There were bald spots on his head. And so he walks in and my eyes get big. I'm like, what happened? What is this? What is going on with this kid? So as we ride up the elevator, I'm, kind of, I'm standing there to myself, but doing the side look, the little like, what happened? Trying to stare, but not stare at the same time because I don't want to be rude uh, and because I'm one of his RAs. And so I'm making all these judgments about him though. I'm like, who the heck walks out with their hair looking like this? Did, do he not, does he not have friends to tell him, bro, your hair looks like crap. <laughs> like what happened that you walked outside with this ratchet haircut? And I'm just making all these judgment calls on him and these assumptions about who he is because of this haircut, because it's so wild and just so out of the norm. Now, as the elevator doors open and we start getting off, I'm like, I have to ask. I turned to him, I was like, dude, what's the story with the hair? I gotta know. And he laughs, he smiles, he turns, he goes, well, it was the easiest 20 bucks I've ever made. I was like, excuse me? Now, what I didn't know, I didn't have the whole story in that moment. What I didn't know as I'm standing there judging him for this haircut is that the night before his, one of his friends went to cut his hair and he laughed and looked at him and said, bro, I'll give you 20 bucks if you let me cut your hair however I want. Like, I'm gonna make it look ugly, but if you wear it all day, I'll give you 20 bucks. And so what's the guy do? He, he smiles and says, bet, let's do it. And so he does, he takes 24 hours and he wears this ratchet haircut all day. And because of that haircut, I speak up and I have this conversation, but first I'm making all these judgments before I know the story of it. Now, it's not something that I'm super proud of to have made these judgments and to put these accusations on his character simply because of a haircut, but I'm super grateful because that story ends really good. He's one of my best friends. In fact, he was my best man at my wedding. It's how I met one of my absolute brothers. And I, was, I got to be his best man this past year. And even though we live in totally different areas, he's in New Orleans right now, uh, we still are super close. And so I'm really grateful for this ratchet haircut and this 20 bucks he made. But I don't love the part of my heart that it revealed in that moment. The fact that I made these assumptions and these judgments on who he was because of it. Now, we all do that all the time. Every single time we go to the grocery store and we see people around us, when we hear that kid in the next aisle screaming his head off, we make these assumptions about what's going on. Oh man, that parent, they can't control their kid. Or what are they doing wearing that? We as humans, we make these assumptions and these judgments upon other people. Now, we're right in the middle of a series called Straight Out of Context where last week pastor did this amazing job talking about this misconception that God just wants me to be happy, that God's whole purpose is so that I can be happy and that my life is filled with the biggest and the best. And that's not what scripture tells us. And so this week, we wanna jump in and looking at Matthew 7, 1 and 2, focusing there. And now what these verses say is, do not judge or you too will be judged. Gosh, how many times have you heard that before? How many times have you heard that used by someone to say, do not judge, you can't judge me. And we use it so far out of context that we don't even finish the verse. We just stop and we just say, do not judge. We don't even go into the rest of it. Why? Because the rest of it challenges us. So how many of us do that with our faith all the time where we take the part that we like and we use it for our good, but we leave the rest behind? the part that's actually challenging and the part that's actually drawing us closer to Jesus, those are the things that we need more of, yet they get left behind so often. And we do that with this here. And so the whole verse, the whole two verses of it is, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. See, we misuse this in a few major ways, but I think the biggest one is that we use it as an excuse. We use it as this excuse to put up a barrier between us and others. We use it as an excuse to go, oh, you can't call me out. You can't tell me how to live my life. It's my life. I get to do what I want to do with it. Don't judge me. Only God can judge. How many of you have seen those t-shirts that people walk around with that say, only God can judge? And they're really taking this verse and twisting it and using it for their purposes, not at all what Jesus is trying to teach us in this. I think the other way we use it as an excuse is to not call others up. 
We use it as an excuse, an excuse to kind of just sit on our hands and to just watch people do whatever the heck they want. And we go, well, Jesus says, don't judge. Do not judge others, right? That's what he says. And that's not at all what he's actually trying to teach us in this. So we let them get away with whatever they want. We watch our friends and our family members make these decisions that we just know are unhealthy. But Jesus isn't telling us to keep quiet about these things that we know are wrong or are unhealthy, things that we know that are against his will. No, he's not telling us to be silent overseers um, as someone ruins their own life going down this path that they shouldn't be going down. Because you see, if that were true, there would be no Christians. The church would not exist. Jesus' purpose would have no purpose because we can't live in a world where both go make disciples and do not judge, let everyone do what they want are true. They don't match up. They don't work out together. And so what we're doing when we judge someone is we're saying that something is good. We have to start with a standard of what is good. If we're judging something, something's good or it's bad. That's in essence what judging is doing. And see, Jesus came to show us what the standard of good is. He gives us a whole book of what good is is and how to live in a way that is healthy and following his will. He calls us to go and make disciples, not just to spread a knowledge, but to make disciples, to teach, to love people, and to encourage them to grow and change. Because you see, a part of growth is becoming more and more like Jesus every day, and that's hard. And we often use this as an excuse to not do that as an excuse to just kind of do whatever the heck we want to do. Because again, you can't live in a world that go make disciples and do not judge, do whatever you want are true. They just don't work. And so we have to ask, well, so then what is he teaching us? What is he trying to say? So I want to put it back into context. If we're taking things out, let's put it back into the context. And to do that, we have to look at what happens before and what happens after. Now, Matthew 7, uh, we're going to look at 1 through 5 in totality, but this chunk is found uh, towards the tail end of one of Jesus' greatest teachings. This is the Sermon on the Mount. It spans multiple chapters in Matthew. If you don't know what this is, it's one of his greatest teachings where he has thousands of people and he is just laying out this whole way of living that's completely radical and totally different to things that they had heard their whole life. So he is shaking up so much in this. And this is just a small snippet of what he's saying. And so it's part of this larger teaching on how we ought to live our lives. So very, first one of do not judge or you too will be judged because he knows that we as humans make these assumptions. He knows that we are going to judge others. He knows that it's just kind of our sinful nature to do this. And so he's giving us a fix. He's kind of helping show us how we can edit this in our lives. What can we do about it? And he continues and he says, for in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And the measure that you use, it will be measured to you. Because you see, we all have these buckets, these buckets full of judgment. And we make these assumptions about people's lives. And we, we look and see them living and doing things and we start putting judgments in their bucket. Oh man, their kids, they're kind of out of control. Let me just put a little bit more judgment on them. Oh, their clothing, it's just not there. It's just not on point today. Now, you might also be thinking, oh, but I'm a Christian, I don't do that. Y'all, it is so much worse in the church than it is outside in the world for this. Why? Because we look at them and we go, gosh, you know, I pray more than they do. I at least do these things. It becomes this competition between us. And what happens to us, we get up on our high holy horses and we look down and we start to pour out more judgment upon these people till their buckets, they're full. And ours over here, we're like, oh, well, I don't want to seem prideful. So I'll be honest, I guess. I'll be a little vulnerable. I'll put some things in my bucket. Yeah, sure, I still struggle with this every now and then. And we might even be willing to be honest at times. And we'll balance it out to some degree. But then what do we do? We go, oh, well, yeah, you know, I was just really stressed that day. 
I, I had a really long week. And so I, it was just a, it was a moment of, of weakness on my side. You know, I'll, I'll just, I'll actually go pray more. I'll spend more time at church. I'll tithe more. And so we, we take things out of our own bucket and we keep putting things in theirs. And so we have this unfair system of how we judge other people. But Jesus is saying, heck no, no, that's not right. I see all of it, the same amount you put in theirs, I am going to put in yours. Why? Because he sees it all. He knows all the excuses, all the reasons we wanna take things out. He sees all those things and he sees more. He sees the deep, dark things that we hide and we put down there because we might not always know the full story of what's going on in their life, but he sure does. And he knows also what's going on in our lives. And so he is saying to us in this, don't put things in their bucket. Don't put things on them that you yourself are not willing to measure up to and be actually honest about. Because Jesus knows all of those things. And we don't wanna seem super prideful, so we'll do all of those things. We'll kind of try to balance it out, but he knows. And what he's saying in those two verses is that if we judge others, we don't get to use excuses. We don't get to use these things to make ourselves look better. He sees it and he knows it. And the coolest thing about this though is that there's a great equalizer. Jesus is the equalizer of this. He's, what he's doing is he's putting us all on the same plane. He is saying, I see your sin and I see their sin. That's why this is even shaped like a cross. The scale and the balance that he brought was through the cross and through the price that he paid. He equalized everything. And so you are being measured against the same thing that they are being measured against, especially in the church especially in our intimate communities. We are being held to that higher standard in so many different ways. Jesus is the great equalizer from it. But he doesn't stop there either. Jesus doesn't just stop with those two. And so to give it greater clarity, he continues. And we need to look at the verses after. And it's another familiar phrase that we also take out of context all the time. And so in verses three through five, we read, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. When you bring all five of these verses together, we can start to see what Jesus is trying to tell us. I think there's two major walkaways from what he's really trying to teach us. The first is grow yourself. Because oftentimes we hear this and we hear it like, oh, we use it as an, an accusatory statement of, oh, go take care of the plank in your own eye first. Then come tell me what's wrong in my life. Go fix yourself first. And so we're using this as this weapon almost, but it's meant to be a weapon kind of aimed at our hearts, aimed at us, aimed at what we are doing with our lives. And so first off, we have to realize that there is a plank in our eye. I don't care where you are in your walk with Jesus, there is a plank in your eye. He says, do not be a hypocrite. We all have sin in our lives that we're battling with, that we're wrestling through that we are working out and we are trying to figure out how, what to do with and how Jesus is rescuing us from it. Don't be someone that wears the name of a Christian in public, but then in private acts totally different is what he's saying. So focus in on yourself first. Do not in front of your friends and family say one thing, but then let your actions show something that's totally different. Some of us, we walk around and we try to help others and you know, we, we just have no idea that there's a plank in our own eye. We don't even realize what's there. And so Jesus is first saying, hey, wake up. Realize there is a plank in your eye. You need me first and foremost. And so we need to turn our focus and our attention to him. Stop being so concerned with the things around you. Stop being so concerned with other people's lives, let, letting that be the priority 
and prioritize your relationship with Jesus first. Asking, okay, what is my life model? How, do I, how am I living my life in a way that prioritizes that? Or does my life prioritize being so concerned about what other people have to say, being so concerned with other people's opinion of me? And so we need to first and foremost, make sure that I'm growing, that I'm learning first. I need to make sure that I'm maximizing my relationship with Jesus first and foremost. And especially in times when it makes me feel uncomfortable. Because like we do with these verses and these things, we like to take it out, put it in our own context so it makes us feel better. But it's the things that make us uncomfortable that cause us to grow the most and cause us to cling to him tighter than ever before. And so even in those times, especially in those times when things are tough or uncomfortable and challenge us, they can push us to become better, but we have to first learn how we're growing. And y'all, we're in one of those times where things are wild. We don't know what is gonna come up on the news the next day. There are so many memes out there about how 2020 has been the most unexpected journey of our lives. And it's true. And we're only four months in. And so we don't even know what is coming down. We have no idea what's coming next, but we do know that Jesus has these promises for us. We do know that we ought to be leaning in in this time to the things he's told us, the things he has told us to be true and clinging tighter than ever before to those truths. I think it also challenges us to ask who around you is willing to have those hard conversations? Who around you is willing to call out and say, hey, there's something in your eye that you need to pay attention to. Not in a mean malice filled way, but in a loving way that's like, hey, I see you going down a path that might not be healthy, that might not be good. But we also have to be intentional about that because that doesn't just happen. We need to be in good community. We need to be surrounded by people that are gonna love us enough to call us up, not just call us out and make us feel bad and make us feel uncomfortable, but call us up to a better and higher way of living. People that are going to help make us better disciples of Jesus. And so are you surrounding yourself with those people? Does your friends do that? Does your family do that? Do your coworkers do this for you? And if not, ask yourself, why not? You might actually need to have a conversation with them that says, hey, please do this. Give them permission to call you out. It's gonna be a little awkward at first, but giving them that permission frees them up to, to be able to have that hard conversation with you. And it makes them know that you feel loved by them. That, you, that they are one of your trusted friends, that you see them as someone that can help better, them, better you and vice versa. And so have that conversation, open yourself up, say to them, hey, I would love you to be able to call out in my life the things that you see are not going well. And if you don't have anyone in your life that you feel you can do that with, well, let's, let us help you. We have awesome small groups here at Ignite. We would love to help get you plugged in. We would love to be able to help point you to community that can help do that for you. Because again, so many of us, we don't know what we don't know. And so we walk around with these planks in our eye that we don't even realize are there. And so secondly, of who are you then reaching out to? Because again, Jesus doesn't stop there after in verse five where he says, you hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye. There's not a period. No, there's a comma. It says, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. He doesn't just stop with worry about yourself and then let everyone else do whatever the heck they want. No, he says, and continues to say, then go help your brothers and sisters. Go help your loved ones know me and to know my love. Because if we truly love them, then we have no choice but to share with those around us his love and message to chase after him. Again, we have no choice but to do that if we truly love people, to have those hard conversations and to reach out to them. Again, we're in this weird season, but we have amazing opportunities right now to do this better than ever before. Because you don't even have to ask someone to go to church with you. You can just send them a link. You can just say, hey, sit in the living room with me. 
Watch this thing that's on TV with me. You can bring it into your kitchen now with your parents, with your family and introduce them to the love and joy that is Jesus. And so Jesus gives us this command on the second half of it to go and, okay, who are you reaching out to? We ought to be boldly walking out our faith and willing to have those hard conversations with people because we are called to that higher standard. This is not an excuse to just sit on our hands and do nothing and let everyone else do whatever the heck they want and live the lifestyle they want to. But this is a call to going, how are we going to love them in a way that shows them the lifestyle Jesus has called us to, the way that Jesus wants us to lead because he, he calls all of us. He doesn't just call me or Pastor Jason or Chris. He doesn't call just those that work at a church to do this. No, he calls all of us to do this. So my challenge for you is how are you doing that? How are you being the hands and feet of Jesus in this season? How are you first taking care of yourself, making sure that you are grounded and you are centered? And how are you then going and how are you then pouring out into those who are around you? How are you then reaching out? Because he doesn't stop there with just take care of yourself. Don't worry about everything else. It'll sort itself out. No, he continues with, you have a calling on your life. And so the biggest three things that we actually learn from do not judge isn't that it really has much to do about us being judged or us judging others. What it has so much to do is that it's not an excuse that we get to do whatever we want. No, and it's not an excuse to cower away from calling people up. It's not this excuse verse that we've used it to be. No, it's saying that we need to first focus in on ourselves. We need to first take a good, deep look and a hearty, truthful look at who are we? What is going on in my heart that I need to work on? What are the sins in my life that I need to first look around to? And how is my relationship with Jesus being prioritized? Who is surrounding me that can help me with this? Who am I bringing into this circle and driving with community to help me see when there is a plank in my own eye? Maybe it's not the largest plank you've ever dealt with and it's a little bit smaller, but there are still things that we have going on in our lives that we need help with. How are we spending time with him? And lastly, the fact that we have a responsibility to then go out to others and to love them in a way that brings them closer to Jesus. We don't get to use this verse as an excuse to sit on the sidelines anymore. No, if we actually understand it, it's a call up and it's a call to go out. And that's one of the biggest things that is on our heart as a church is how are we loving people that don't know him, especially in this season when social distancing is happening, it feels like we're farther apart than ever before. But when we take this, we realize that Jesus is calling us and saying, hey, we can actually draw closer than ever before. He can now enter into our homes and he now has these all kinds of platforms that we get to use as a church to be able to bring Jesus right into your hand, right onto your devices. And how are you leveraging that? Realize that we have a responsibility in this season because it is so easy. I'm victim of it too. It's so easy in this time where of quarantine of just staying at home all day, every day. Yep, not even gonna change. I'm gonna stay in my pajamas all day and I'm just gonna loaf around, do my work and mind my own business. But we have a higher calling on our life. And so the question from me to you is how are you responding to this higher calling? Stop using these excuses to be mediocre and use them to actually do the purpose they're meant to of calling us up, to calling us to be better followers of Christ. Go ahead and bow with me as we pray. Father, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you so much for the fact that we get to gather with you, even though we are all spread apart, we still get to worship you and we get to know you you more and more, Jesus. Thank you for your word and thank you for the fact that you have taught us how to live and how to lead best in this life. 
We're so grateful for you, Lord, and for the time that we now get to spend with these people that we are quarantined with and how we get to connect differently. Jesus, I pray that this week would be filled with energy of focusing in on my own walk, that we would focus in on our own walks with you, our own relationships with you first, and then out of the overflow of that, we would be able to pour into others. We would be able to love on those around us better than ever before. Jesus, we are so grateful for you and all that you've done. And it is in your high, precious name that we pray. Amen.